pre presenting, so I'm basically I'm presenting this recent work on machine learning for material science is the, is the general scheme. And um, basically uh, the title of the paper is Accelerating DLT at Fire Temperature with Deep Neural Networks. And my collaborators are um, here, uh, the, the group at Sandia I was formerly part of. So Austin, uh, Norman, um, Adam, Aiden, and Siva. And maybe you, if you, maybe you went to the talk that Siva gave at the annual workshop. So he presented part of this work already there. Um, so let's see, what is um, the context? So, right, so we are basically, the, the general context of this is um, material science and methods for material science, in particular EFT. So just move this here. So, um, and the, the main result of this is basically, uh, how can we accelerate electronic structure calculations with EFT using machine learning? That's the general theme. And um, the, the use for this would be multi-scale materials model. So uh, that would be very useful to have. So we have, I mean, there, there's materials, multi-scale materials modeling already, but what we would need is actually modeling at a higher accuracy, close to first principles accuracy. That would be very useful. Um, for um, various things like novel materials discovery or for um, planetary physics. And, and the point is here are two pictures. Um, one here shows the, uh, the reactor of, of ITER, of a tokamak reactor. And what happens here is that uh, when, when you have a plasma in this, in this uh, reactor, um, there are particles in particular alpha particles that uh, damage the reactor walls. And to be able to understand how, 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 to, how, how this breaks, so how do the walls get damaged, to understand this, we would need multi-scale materials modeling. So we'd like to model how, how the alpha particles, for example, interact with the uh, um, atoms in the wall. And this can only be done if you can model uh, those reactions at large time and next scales, which we cannot do at high accuracy at this point. Uh, and the same is true for um, planetary uh, science. So this is uh, uh, just basically this picture is showing uh, the, oh, symbolizing the core of a giant gas planet. Uh, again, to understand how materials, for example, be mix in the core of such planets, you would also need multi-scale materials model. And so they are basically what is plotted here now is um, on the one hand, uh, on the y-axis, the accuracy and computational cost of a method. And on, on, this, on the x-axis, the length scales, length and time scales actually. So we have these methods, I call them device scale simulations that work on, um, on the macroscopic length and time scales, so centimeters, milliseconds, roughly speaking. And these are methods like continuum mechanics, fluid dynamics, magnetohydrodynamics, and PIC. And these methods work well there, but the problem is they're not accurate enough. In particular, uh, what is missing in these methods are the atomic structure or even uh, if you go further, the correlation among electrons. So these are effects we would like to incorporate into these large scale simulations to increase their accuracy. And this is missing. On the other hand, we have actually methods that work very well uh, to deal with the electronic structure at the microscopic level. Things like quantum Monte Carlo that Tobias is working on and then density function theory that various people here are working on. These are method that, methods that work very well on, on the small length and time scales, typically nanometers and femtoseconds. We can do, can compute the electronic structure 
at those length and time scales well. We can do quantum dynamics very well. Um, but the problem is these methods are very costly. Like DFT typically scales as the cube of the system size. And even with increasing computational power on exascale machines, this will never be enough to actually do multi-scale materials modeling on, on the big length and time scales that we are after. Yes. I have a quick question. Uh, I hear this term first principles coming up every now and then. What is meant by first principles? So what we mean by that is that uh, there is no empiricism. So we mean we know that the equations, the differential equations for the problem, and we just solved them without any empirical input. So if empiricism is like we approximate because we know it behaves kind of like that. Yeah. Okay. So you're trying to not approximate, you're going down to the real equations and you're working with that. Yeah. Very strictly speaking, uh, so strictly speaking, quantum Monte Carlo would be first principles mm -hmm. because you're not approximating, but you're solving the, in this case, the Schrodinger equation, the electronic Schrodinger equation, and you can um, basically uh, measure the error of your calculations. When you do DFT calculations, mm -hmm. strictly speaking, you're introducing some approximations, but in principle, the method is exact. So often DFT is also called first principles method, but depending on who you ask, you might get two answers, but it's still not that empirical as something like molecular dynamics, where you have very drastic approximations on mm -hmm. how the forces are computed on the atoms. So. So basically, first principles here means in a different, expressed in a different way, it would be, we know that what the constituents are of what we want to simulate, these are atoms and electrons, mm -hmm. and we solve the differential equations that we know are correct, mm -hmm. um, up to, like, in this case, it's quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. what, what I neglect are relativistic effects, for example. Okay, okay. But I think you got a picture, yeah. But thank you. <laughs> So now to, to have to cross the bridge from microscale nanometers, femtoseconds to centimeters and milliseconds, we need a, an idea method how we can achieve this. And here the idea is we uh, use machine learning. Um, so we basically bypass this computational bottleneck of DFT in this case by using machine learning methods. And that will, of course, introduce some errors. But, and what I, and this is the, the main message of this talk is what I hope to convince you is that um, we have now a method, a machine learning method, that is as accurate, almost as accurate as DFT. And in the future, hopefully, that will lead to multi scale modeling. So, before we go there, uh, some trivia. Um, so how did all of this start? So how did machine learning methods go into the FT and all of that? And there was a very nice workshop in some time ago in 2011. Uh, this was hosted by IPAM, which is the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics at UCLA. And I was finishing up my PhD uh, in Kiran's group, uh, who gave a talk not too long ago here. And actually, there was this workshop which was called Navigating Chemical Compound Space for Materials and Biodesign. The name doesn't really tell you that much, but actually, it was um, one of the first machine learning workshops for electronic structure theory. It was organized by Anatol. Um, and he brought, it was a long, long term workshop of three months, March to June. And it focused on different topics. And I attended most of them. And uh, there were lots of different people from various fields, but mainly bringing together mathematicians who work on machine learning with um, material scientists, roughly speaking. And the first ideas about using material science and uh, machine learning in DFT came up there. It took quite some time until the first papers came out. And also here are the pictures of the I would say the main players of that workshop. And if you look at the literature on, on interatomic potentials and machine learning developments in DFT, material science, 
these are the names that show up uh, most most of the time. Um, so this is how that started. And now let me again one more time. <laughs> Some you've seen this already. Uh, just a brief recap of DFT, a bit more adapted to the context of, of machine learning of what we will do here. Um, so right, the, the problem that we have is um, the coupled, a coupled system of electrons and ions. And now, so what does it mean? So we have ions at, at coordinates R, capital R. So R1 to Rm are the positions in space where the ions are located. And then we have positions of the electrons. And then we can write down a differential equation that tells us uh, basically um, the properties of the system. And that's the electronic Schrödinger equation with the given Hamiltonian written here. And this is already one approximation, approximation which is uh, the born oppenheim approximation. It means that the ions, which are much more, which are heavy, much more heavy than the electrons, are on a much slower time scale than the electrons. So we can decouple the problems of the ion, the problem of the ions from the problem of the electrons. And this is very roughly speaking what the born oppenheim approximation does. So we can already simplify the, the differential equation and we arrive at this Schrödinger equation. And then where, okay, where you see this now, um, I've kind of, to be a bit more explicit, I've expressed the dependencies on the electronic and nuclear coordinates here. And this means uh, semicolon R, it's a parametric dependence. So for a given positions of the ions in space, we solve this equation for the electrons, where this psi, capital psi here is the electronic wave function that depends on all the coordinates r, r1 to rn of the electrons. So it's a multi-dimensional problem. So it's very difficult to solve. Um, and that's where DFT comes into play. So DFT is basically uh, a smart way to solve this problem, to make this problem feasible. And it basically solves this uh, many-body system of interacting electrons. In principle, exact. In practice, we have approximations. And the way how this happens is that we map this complicated Schrodinger equation into a simpler problem of non-interacting electrons or particles. And that's the corresponding differential equation. And you have n of those. For each electron, there is one equation. Uh, and you solve those equations. And the trick is all in this Vs, which is an effective potential that describes the interaction between the electrons in a feasible way. And this is approximate because this Vs has to be approximated in practice. And this word cloud here is an illustration of the different types of approximations we have. So there are maybe 100 or more approximate functionals. So these are called exchange correlation functionals that basically tell you what Vs is, what the effective potential is. And there, it's still an active area of research to come up with more accurate functionals. Um, but we have already, I mean, this is a field that's, that already has developed over several decades. So we have, we know the accuracy of approximations, we know when they work and when they fail and so on. Um, and now when you solve these equations, the main quantity you're interested in is the density. And you basically build up your density, your electronic density from the solutions psi j of, of the cohn sham equations. So these are called the cohn sham equations. And in particular, we're interested at uh, meta and extreme conditions, which means temperature. And this prefactor here is the Fermi Dirac distribution. So this is where the temperature comes into play. This occupies the electronic states according to a given temperature. And why is this important? Because it has a vast amount of applications in chemistry, material science, and even other fields. This is, uh, might have seen this before. This is a plot of the number of citations of DFT 
uh, just up to 2013. And these are kilo papers. So by now I'm sure this it's I'm not sure if it's an exponential exponential growth, but it's a, a fast growth. So this is the quick recap on the theory of DFT. Now let's come to the machine learning part. Um, so there has been some prior work um, where machine learning methods have been used in DFT, and I am just kind of uh, just collected a few of them here, and I will not go into the details of these papers, but you can kind of group them into a few topics. And the first papers were basically uh, on, um, on the prediction of molecular properties and simple crystal structures using machine learning methods. So they used basically the descriptors like the positions of the atoms in space and pred predicted molecular properties like binding energies and things like this. And then further work has gone into actually um, approximating pieces of um, or quantities of DFT itself. And one important quantity is the kinetic energy of the electrons. So there, there has been some papers in the last few years that, that did that. And then finally, only in the last two years, there have been a few papers that actually started um, approximating the solutions of the Kuhn-Sharm equations using machine learning methods. And mainly those methods, they have predicted electronic density or the density of states. Um, and this is where we are. And then uh, our paper here deals actually with the last category. So we actually want to predict um, quantities, or we actually want to right, we want to avoid solving the Kuhn-Sharm equations using machine learning methods. So we basically predict the main, or one of the main outputs of the Kuhn-Sharm equations. And we do it at finite electronic temperature that hadn't been done before. And we use a standard approach, feedforward neural networks. And what the output of this method is, is what is called the Born-Oppenheimer potential energy surface at finite temperature. And what this is, you can imagine, this is an energy landscape on which the atoms live. And this energy landscape determines the forces on the atoms for their dynamics at a given temperature. And this is exactly what you need if you're interested in any kind of material science question for matter under extreme conditions. So for these questions about the stability of matter in, for example, in the fusion reactor, this is exactly what you would need for that. So um, here again, the input is input for the machine learning neural network is just the positions. Exactly. The, and I'll come to this in a moment. The, the only input is the types and positions of atoms in space. And the output is what? Density of states. Or the density of states, or in this case, the local density of states. Uh, and I, I have a few slides on this uh, coming up. Um, yeah, so this is now uh, an overview of, of our method. Um, so we have, we can kind of split it up into a few steps. So the first step is what also Sachin just mentioned is what is the input? So we prepare the input to the machine learning uh, workflow. So we call this fingerprint generation. And this is basically atomic snapshots. And this is a illustration of this. So you have a, your simulation cell. And in this case, we had 256 atoms. In this case, aluminum. So we were looking at liquid aluminum in this, in this work. And, and you see they're not in, it's not a crystal structure. It's not a regular crystal structure as you, you would expect from a, a solid at room temperature. Because it's a liquid, the atoms are displaced from their crystal structure positions. And based on these positions, we will generate fingerprints. And these are snap fingerprints. And I'll explain a bit more in detail later what, what these are. But this is just a representation, basically, of the distribution of, distribution of the atoms in space. And we do this 
by splitting up space onto a Cartesian grid. And all of that forms the input. And then we, we define a feedforward neural network architecture and feed that uh, fingerprint as an input into this network and train the network. So we adjust the biases and the weights according to the target output that we have generated with DFT, right? And then the output of this is this quantity L does, which is the local density of states. Roughly speaking, you could think about it as uh, a more general quantity than the electronic density, but you can reduce that quantity to the electronic density, which I'll show in a moment. And that's kind of illustrated here as the red orange cloud. Uh, and so for a given atomic configuration, this neural network predicts what the local density of states is. And then based on this local density of states, we can compute all the properties we're interested in, in particular, the total energy. And we'll come to this plot later. Um, and to give you a rough overview of um, a few more details of the machine learning um, workflow. So we basically have, um, so one of these snapshots, right, the volume of data that is contained in one of these snapshots is about 20 gigabytes of data that we have to uh, put through this uh, workflow. And we have to train the, the neural network on, on this amount of data, which is, I believe, I mean, there are applications that have a much higher data volume, but it was already quite, quite high and quite challenging to do this. Um, and we'll come to hyperparameterization, hyperparameter optimization a bit later. But for the best, the final model, we, we needed 144 epochs of training. And one epoch took about 90 minutes. And once trained, the machine learning inference of the LDOS takes about 30 seconds. And, well, I didn't put the number here, probably I should have done this. A DFT calculation for one snapshot will take several hours, up to eight hours. So we can cut down the time once trained from eight hours to 30 seconds, which is a, a huge, huge speed up. Um, here, a few more details on the quantity. So, uh, right, so we, we kind of have to generalize DFT a little bit to make it useful in this machine learning framework. So instead of working with the density itself, we work with the quantity I had mentioned already earlier, it's this local density of states. So it's a more generalized quantity of the density, but you build it up of, uh, from the Kuhn-Sharm orbitals and it's just weighted by a delta function. This is how it's defined. Um, and then, the advantage is that if you work with this quantity, you can express all the quantities in terms of, of this quantity, which you couldn't do if you just work with the density. And in particular, we can express this total energy. So this is the basically the born Oppenheimer potential energy surface. This is the main quantity we need. We can compute it from the density of states. So all these terms are determined by that. And we- Hello, Attila? Yes. So the, the LDOS is really just evaluated at the epsilon j points. Do I get this right or? Um, so yes, so it's weighted. So it's this, um, it's, it's a quantity that depends on space. So on R and on the energy. Okay, so it's continuous in R, but uh, um, non-continuous in epsilon. Um, no, it's also continuous in epsilon, but it's weighted by only at these uh, at at given uh, points j. But the deltas are just deltas, so they're either one, they're either on or off. They're on or off, but in the end, so I, I didn't go into these details here, but actually, it's a smooth representation of the delta function that we use. Ah, okay. That makes it smooth, but otherwise, okay. you're right. Otherwise, it okay. would be okay. Fine, because I wanted to ask how you how you took care of the sparsity then. 
Okay, yeah. fine. But if it's smooth, then things are easier. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In the end, it's smooth. And actually, this was a, a point I'll come back to in a moment. Um, it wasn't obvious. This was a technical difficulty how to deal with this. Um, and I can go into a bit more details on this. Okay, please, please go ahead. I'm sorry for this. Actually, I'll follow, follow up question on the on the deltas. Sure. Um, so do you do you still take them in the limit, or are you just using like the kind of the actual kind of finite version of a of a delta function? In in the end, it's it's a Gaussian representation of a delta function that we will use. Okay. So uh, a smeared Gaussian. So well, a Gaussian that is a smeared representation of the delta function. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then this is the main quantity that usually we deal, uh, we care about in DFT, the electronic density. And by integrating over energy of the local density of states, you get that energy, uh, that quantity, the density. And the other quantity that actually we care about is what is called the band energy, which we couldn't compute just from the density, but we can compute it from the density of states by integrating the LDOS over roughly speaking, just the energy. And it's weighted by the energy itself. And then we have other quantities like the entropy um, that, that we can also extract from the local uh, states. Just one more question. This, this way of writing this with the brackets, what does it mean again? So this is a, this is a short form for an integral or? Oh, no. Uh, this one here, for example, the bracket D means it's a functional. So uh, it's, it's a functional, OK. Yeah. Okay, that's what it is. Uh, and yeah, it's like a common uh, notation in DFT. So everything in DFT is a functional of the density. Mm. So you would write bracket N. And here to show the difference to regular DFT, I wrote everything as bracket D. Okay. So, so these are all the ingredients we need. So basically, I mean, this slide was to show that having that if we can predict the local density of states, we can compute all the quantities we're interested in. I thought in principle, the density could give you everything. Is it just that it's inconvenient um, compared to the local density of states? Or... Yeah, so that's right. Uh, so in principle, that's this principle thing. Okay. <laughs> that's just the principle. So it's true that uh, in DFT in principle, um, the Hohenberg cone theorem guarantees that the, you can compute any quantity from the density. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping from density to potential and all the other quantities, but it doesn't tell you how. So you know that for a given density, there is a unique uh, mapping, for example, to the potential and from there to the kinetic energy, but there is no formula. Okay that you can evaluate that tells you what that kinetic energy is. And so that's basically the whole point of orbital. There's something called orbital free DFT. And that is on that question. How do we get a kinetic energy from a given density? And we avoid all of this by using the LDOS. So, so maybe to, to, to maybe also for uh, the DFT folks, um, so this is not how it is done, in, how people do that in, in like usually. So this is not a standard approach. Using the LDOS is something highly unusual, but it turns out to be advantageous uh, here when we have a machine learning uh, formulation of DFT. And now, so now uh, let's go a little bit more into each of the, of the steps of our workflow. So the first is uh, data generation. And this is really just to, to show you that we were careful. So we, we have basically at um, the melting point of aluminum, we had two sets of data. Up here, we have the solid phase. Um, and down here is one atomic snapshot of the liquid phase. And you can tell them easily apart by right, the solid phase looks more crystalline than the liquid phase. This is how, what the difference is. And we did, we generated then training data, in this case for uh, 256 atom cells of aluminum, right? And we used, in this case, the quantum espresso code, which is one of the standard codes 
that we can use. And here are some of the details we don't need to go into, basically. I mean, what kind of pseudo potential we used and what functional we used. And we made sure that everything converged and so on. And we basically had, which I'm not going much into, we actually first started at room temperature. And when we saw that everything worked well, we immediately went to this to the melting point because this was the more challenging and more interesting case. And we basically had 10 of these atomic snapshots for each of the phases. So we, we generated our data. Um, and so each snap, snapshot was about 20 gigabytes, so 30 times that, roughly speaking. Um, and then there is this little point, because we're not doing regular DFT, but we're using this LDOS, there was a challenge with respect to computing the LDOS. And now, now this is the point where um, Michael asked and also Ulrich asked about the smearing of the delta function. You have to be very careful how you do that. And this is what this slide is about. And it shows you here on these plots, right up here, you have the density of states plotted for one atomic snapshot of liquid aluminum. Um, and here, um, different choices of the k-point grid of the DFT calculation and smearing of the, of the delta function. And basically what you want to avoid is you have to be careful. You don't want uh, too much noise in the, in the density of states. And you can get too much noise. Basically, the, the bottom line is if you're, and this is a detail of the calculation, so your k-point grid has to be large enough, and that makes the calculation expensive. And the smearing should be chosen well, and that's shown here. So if you pick a smearing that is, so if the width of your Gaussian is too small, you introduce errors. So it should be smeared well enough, and the k-point grid has to be large enough. That's the bottom line. Uh, and uh, since it's somewhat of a detail, I, I don't want to go into more details, but if people with a DFT background have questions, I, I can answer those later. So that was one technical difficulty we had to deal with. There was another technical difficulty, and this is now right based on the LDOS. We now want to com compute quantities. So we have to take these integrals of G, I call it G a general function, and often in most cases it is the Fermi distribution function times the LDOS. And the problem is that this um, quantity G is, it changes rapidly compared to D. So it makes evaluating this integral difficult. And to solve that difficulty, what we did is we kind of used a few analytical tricks because of the structure of the mathematical structure of G, we can somehow, we could, we were able to write this integral in terms of pulley logarithms and then use, uh, well, somehow rewrite this integral as a sum over weights and we could express the weights as analytical functions and they're given here on the right. I so, know some guy who might have some ideas on that. I know you're talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. I would be curious or interested in. No, I mean, Mich I mean, Michael would surely also maybe. Uh, Michael Hecht. Yeah. I'm meeting him tomorrow, so I, I, I can show him this. <laughs> um, but basically, we at least for the purposes of, of this paper here we were happy with the solution here. So it's basically we could convert the, the numerical integration into a semi-analytical integration and we could get rid of any noise that could be a problem here. Um, so that was another technical difficulty we had to solve. And um, the second step then was the fingerprint generation. And so there's one assumption uh, is that mainly that this local density of states uh, can be approximated in by at any point in space 
by a function that depends only on the positions and chemical identities of atoms. And this is something we assume. It seems to be true, but uh, it's something to remember. <laughs> Um, it's, it's one of the assumptions in, in this workflow. Um, and then we construct basically fingerprints um, that map an atomic neighborhood at each grid point in space to a set of scalar values. And these are our descriptors that go into the machine learning model. And now you have uh, an infinite amount of choice of descriptors, basically. So which one do you choose? And we know that from uh, past experience that a good descriptor should satisfy a few requirements. And one is invariance under permutation, translation, and rotation of the atoms in the neighborhood. So just imagine you have this simulation cell with atoms of liquid aluminum. The properties of your system should not change when you rotate this cube, right? That's uh, basically a standard property you want to uh, preserve. So the, the descriptor that describes your atomic snapshot should, should satisfy that. And it should also be continuous, um, at, in particular at the boundary of your neighborhoods. And again, without going too much into the details, uh, we use this snap descriptor. And it's roughly speaking, it's um, here Right, we have this Cartesian mesh of our simulation cell, and then we go to each grid point R of this um, in this mesh, and then we define what the descriptor is, and it's basically a weighted sum of delta functions for each um, and um, right at pointing um, so located at each point on the grid, and this FC is uh, a cutoff sphere. So around each grid point, we define a cutoff sphere um, with radius r. And this w is a weight, uh, right? And, and well, I forgot one detail. This rk is pointing to the atoms in the simulation cell. And this w is a factor that contains information on the type of atom. So is it an aluminum atom or iron atom or whatever atom it is? So this is the descriptor. And then what we do is we expand this descriptor in a basis of four-dimensional hyperspherical harmonic functions. And this is what is shown on the right. It's, it's a choice, and, and that's what the snap descriptor is. Um, and it's just a convenient choice. It preserves the properties above. And um, it was convenient in our case. It, it, also, it also smooths out things, doesn't it? Again? It is also smooth, yes, that is correct. And it's also a descriptor that is implemented already, or it has been used in the LAMS code. And so we knew, well, it was, it's highly efficient, and we know it works quite well to map atomic environments. Is it, and it's yeah. also okay for for free states. Um, free states. You mean? Um, what do you mean with free states? I mean, I mean, this is this is this is some symmetries in there, and it's around the atom. I, I'm not quite sure what I'm seeing there. Maybe, uh, maybe you can describe it a bit better. So it's. Uh, why do I see all these symmetries still still showing up? Oh, so this was just an illustration of what uh, 4D hyperspherical harmonic functions are. So what is shown this? So what is shown on the right is not the snap descriptor itself, but it's the okay. basis functions. So the capital U J. Okay, sorry. So okay, it's sorry. just so I unfortunately I don't have a plot of the of the snap descriptor itself, but it's okay. basically a vector with 91 scalar entries. And you just did this to to reduce the actually the descriptive um, to to have a to have a condensed description by ninety one entries of this uh, uh, snap descriptor uh, of the snap descriptor itself. So that's what you're doing. You're basically approximating it with uh, 
Yes. Well, well, this is the snap descriptor itself, and it is a compact representation of the atomic environment at each grid point mm -hmm. in our simulation cell. So you why are you doing the hyperspherical harmonic function expansion then anyways? Ah, okay. This is part of the snap descriptor. So this is it was convenient for them to use them because okay. it's it's also more compact than the first equation. Correct. Okay. So there's two two compactifications in a certain sense. Okay, fine, fine, fine. So now we have at each grid point we have this vector with 91 entries, and that tells us where basically where the posit like what is the envi atomic environment of each grid point. Um, Adila, sorry, just a, just another quick question about this. Yeah. Um, so um, it's maybe stupid, but what does SNAP stand for? Um, spectral neighbor atomic potential. <laughs> okay. Um, it's just a name. <laughs> okay. And uh, apart from apart from the 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 for the uh, hyperspherical harmonics being apparently convenient to the to the symmetries that your um, uh, atoms have uh, is there i mean you, you could probably use an expansion in any other function system right yes as long as they um, satisfy invariances above yeah okay and so this is the main choice why the snap descriptors are used because it's one set of basis functions that satisfies these requirements Okay, thank you. At the, at, so, sure, you're welcome. At the beginning, when people developed descriptors, uh, in particular for DFT, they did not pay attention to this, and uh, it ended up with uh, very bad results. Because when you kind of rotated your frame of reference, the results would change, and that's highly unphysical. And then uh, just a little bit about the machine learning workflow itself. So, I mean, it's this is in this case really just a standard feed forward neural network with a given number of hidden layers. Uh, in our case, we had five, yes, five layers. So, this is the, the liquid aluminum model, 933 Kelvin. Um, and this is just a representation of an intermediate layer, right? You have weights, W. Uh, biases and our and we follow this regular workflow we train so we have a training stage where we optimize the weights and biases through regular back propagation and we minimize the root mean square loss between the prediction and the target and the target is given by by the dft calculations and then we do validation where we tune the hyperparameters and then in the end, there is the testing. And we, as, as is usually we split up our training sets into training test sets, validation test sets, and right, testing test sets. So testing test sets have not been used in validation or training. Um, and this is pretty much, I think, what was already on the first slide, right? So, uh, so I, don't, I won't repeat this. Um, so it's it's actually a fairly standard uh, P4 neural network. So no real surprises. Um, and then we come to our results. So on the right, I have the solid phase. On the left, the liquid phase. And now this is the density of states output. So I didn't show the LDOS itself because right, it's spatially dependent and energy dependent, so it's kind of hard to plot. So what I'm plotting here is just the density of states. This is what you get when you, if you remember the slide of the equations, when I integrate over space, integrate out all the space coordinates, what is left is the energy dependence, and that is what is called the density of states. And that's shown here for both the liquid and solid snapshots. And as you can see, the, the upper panel is the quantity itself. The lower panel is the error. And you see the error is tiny. You can't really tell the difference between the red machine learning prediction and the black target. So it learned it very well. Um, by the way, maybe for DFT people here, you see some structure here in the density of states. 
And that structure should be present. This is what is called van Hoof instabilities. These are critical points of the density of states. And, and that's an important point. If you don't do these calculations well, you might just have a noise and you might not resolve these instabilities. These instabilities, right, you see they, as you increase the temperature and decrease the order in your system, they disappear, which you can see in the liquid, uh, the liquid structure. But if, if you don't pay attention, you cannot resolve them or you might have artifacts that shouldn't be there. So, so again, again, this is dimension dependent, right? Because in 2D, you're via singularity. Exactly, exactly. So this is 3D, right? So you have uh, critical points and no, no divergences. The next quantity uh, that we then can extract is the electronic density. Well, maybe quickly going back, um, I forgot to mention here, the main point is that, right, we will, in the end, we'll compute energies and we will integrate over energy. And here we wanted to show that mainly that there is no cancellation of errors. So it's not that the machine learning is predicting some oscillating curve, and then when you integrate over it, the integral is accurate. The point is that also the quantity itself is accurate. That was the main point to show here. Uh, on this slide, the electronic density. Um, so what is plotted here is um, for each grid point in space, we compute the value of the electronic density from the L dots. And um, right, it's on the x-axis, the target electronic density, and on the y-axis, the predicted. So if the prediction is correct, everything should line up on the diagonal. And you see that this is in case true, there is a small standard deviation only, which is nice. And you see a little bit that, uh, well, you can see actually that the accuracy is somewhat higher for the solid, more regular snapshots than for the disordered liquid. But in any case, in both cases, it is accurate. And the real accuracy is measured by the energy which is um, now plotted here. So this is um, first, what we did is a separate model. So one machine learning model for the solid snapshots and a separate model for the liquid snapshots. So training data was either solid or liquid. And here is, uh, well, I should have showed the total energy, but it doesn't matter. It's the band energy what is plotted here. And so black again here is the targets. The red line distinguishes the liquid from the solid snapshots. And so let's first look at the solid. So the right-hand side, you see that the energies are predicted very well. Um, but if you now just used um, the solid model, and performed a machine learning inference on a liquid snapshot, then you would get these points on the left and you would get high errors as expected. So you would somehow, right, you would do a machine learning inference of something it has never seen before. So it performs quite poorly. And the same is true the other way around. If you train on liquid, it does very well on liquid. But if you use that machine learning model, that was trained on liquid and predict on solid snapshots, it does prove. Now the main question was, can we find a model that works for both? And that's the main result and that's shown here. And indeed it, it turns out we can. So this is uh, basically, we use both in the training and then did the inference on both types of snapshots liquid or solid, and we see that actually the accuracy is quite high. And what is shown in this table down here is, is this is the main result, the model where we had four liquid and four solid training sets, one validation set, and then we could do testing on six liquid or five solid snapshots. And the main number is here. So for the 
uh, liquid, we get an error of 15 milli electron volt per atom, and we get an error of 12 milli electron volt per atom for the solid snapshots. And it turns out this is very accurate. And how do we quantify this? It's basically energy differences. So one, one measure to quantify this is what is the energy differences of structures between solid and liquid snapshots? And that's about 100 MeV per atom. So we're far below that energy resolution. And another um, quantity or measure to measure the accuracy is chemical accuracy. And chemical accuracy is basically the energy content in uh, transitions of chemical states. And that energy value is one kilocalories per mole, which is translated to milli electron volts per atom, roughly 50, 44. So we are also below that. So we can basically resolve all of these quantities to this accuracy. And a, a third uh, measure would be, um, and I kind of need to go a little bit into molecular dynamics here. So there are molecular dynamics um, simulations, right? And you have their interatomic potentials. And the best interatomic potentials, the most accurate interatomic potentials in molecular dynamics have an accuracy of five milli electron volt per atom. So we are close to that. We don't achieve that quite well, but we're close to that. So with all that, um, we are actually quite accurate, very accurate, accurate to be useful. And with that, I'm basically almost at the end of the talk. So this is the summary. So now this was basically the first proof of principle that this works. And then there's a lot that can be done now. And I listed a few plans for the future. And one is to continue this work, which is I call it classical supervised machine learning, where we use basically uh, deep neural networks like feed forward neural networks like here, but we could use other neural networks. So things to do are to look at the choice of descriptors. So we used one descriptor, the snap descriptor, but there are other types or more general classes of descriptors that could be used. And this might lead to even more accurate results. We haven't actually played much with the architecture of the neural network here, and we only used one type of neural network. Then we actually did the simplest hyperparameter tuning we could do, but there's a lot more that can be done here, in particular, um, multivariate interpolation. So Michael Hecht's uh, method could be applied here. And on the methodological side, we, we can now predict energies, but what we actually want are forces. So by taking, so now we have the energies that I showed. If we now take the derivative of these energies with respect to displacements of the atoms in space, we will get molecular forces. And what we, what we can do then is um, DFT level uh, molecular dynamics. Uh, at very high speeds, right? So one step will take one inference, so it takes about 30 seconds to time propagate uh, in each step. So that would be something very exciting to do. Um, but then we also want to look at a different class of machine learning. And this is, uh, we've already started doing that in, in the PIN workshop. So we want to actually look at physics informed neural networks and solve um, the Kuhn-Sharm equations or optimize them or interpolate them using pins. And we want to do this for the time independent Kuhn-Sharm equations. And it would be similar to what was done here, but I believe a much more compact and potentially more accurate representation. But then we also want to go to the time generalization of these equations. These are the time dependent Kuhn-Sharm equations. And solve them with pins. And that would be very interesting because then we can compute response properties and quantum dynamics directly, which is very relevant to all those scattering experiments that are done at XFEL and so on. And the third class would be actually to look at uh, multivariate interpolation 
for the Kuhn-Sharm equations itself. So instead of using machine learning, you could also just do multivariate interpolation. And I think, yeah, with that, I'm finished. And uh, happy to uh, take any questions. We're happy to discuss.